Well, 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 theology nerds. Hey, hey, it's like we talked yesterday, if you listen to every episode on the day they come out. Which you should. Yeah, well, especially if you live in cities with traffic. So, like, <laughs> this is a shout out to everyone in L.A., in Atlanta, in D.C., Chicago. You know those places where you have to pay more to live there? And you get the opportunity to spend hours every day in a small, confined car, disengaged from the rest of the world, where we try to bring you nerdy things to, so that you can you can say, like, I may not have been able to move my body, but the the theology nerds' friends over there at Homebrew, they gave me things to move my mind. Mm, and my spirit. Oh, yeah. And today on the podcast, Eric Hall is going to be uh, dropping some bombs. Eric is uh, the author of the Homebrewed Christianity Guide to God. He is also, now let me tell you this very, very weird title, you know, because he teaches ethics at a Catholic school. Um, and so they get really cool names. Like this is his chair. The Archbishop Raymond G. Hunthausen, Professor of Peace and Social Justice at Carroll College in Helena, Montana. Now, he wrote a book called The Paradox of Authenticity about like Charles Taylor and hermeneutical Ooh, theology. Love. And it's it's the opposite of this book. The Homebrew <laughs> Christianity Guide to God was made for a, a, a human to read. Yeah. That book was made for uh, scholars mm-hmm. that forgot their humanity to read. I personally loved it. But the, the guide to God, every everything you needed to know about the Almighty is in... Just like, let's see, 150 very small pages you can fit in your pocket. Um, best part of Eric's book is that he's Catholic, a uh, Catholic social ethicist who used to be a Pentecostal, a Platonist who then decided because he was getting married, he should pick the most Platonist uh, form of Christianity. And then he somehow ends up, goes from being an Anglican to uh, like Catholic. Well, you know, and not living in Seattle or LA anymore. No, but Montana is a weird place. But to moving to Helena, Montana. No, that Helena is full of really? Catholics because oh. the Carroll College is there, and that's where like the, the there's a big cathedral, um, and it's a it's a sweet school. So uh, anyway, in this conversation, Eric decides since he's in a room of of day drinking progressive Protestants to witness on behalf of the Catholic tradition. That's hilarious. Uh, so I just in it want you all to know in advance, Eric and I are very good friends. So when he makes horribly sarcastic comments, and if you are a progressive Protestant, you're like, I, that makes me feel awkward. No, he is like literally looking at me and directing them at me, knowing that this is like it's not an interview, so he gets to lecture me. Um, and so in the room, people are enjoying this jousting. Um, so just you know, hear it that way. <laughs> but uh, the other thing I was going to say is, um, and we'll put a link to this on the blog post page. Eric, because of the Pope, the Pope's just like, we got we to gotta come up with integral ecology, making ecology integral to our education as Catholics and as Christians and stuff. Uh, he, he wrote a big, uh, a, a big uh, book about why you should do that, which they put in Latin because mm, he's the Pope, know, you know. but uh, an encyclical, like which did. makes it sound even more like, awesome. Yeah. But since he's a you know an ethics professor of like peace and justice, he has to do what the Pope says. Mm-hmm. So so Eric is putting together the summer camps for like high schoolers to integrate ecology and faith in their own understanding of uh, themselves, God, and the world. Hopefully, right, creating people who, when they go to college, when they go to, into their vocations, are not just wanting to um, figure out how they can grow the bottom line, but create. Uh, uh, to be people who are invested in creating a more fruitful and life-giving relationship between human beings, our economy, and our uh, our consumption patterns in the earth. So I know that he has scholarships for people that listen to the podcast who have like a teenager at their church who would be into it, or you have a, know a friend that's a youth minister that's like, how do I get a leader in my youth group who is like down for the planet? to get some experiences, training, and stuff so they can help lead the group. Um, I know what it's like to be the youth minister who wishes you had some tree huggers. That was my experience prior to moving to California. Well, I <laughs> love you trees, mo- as you know. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> why? <laughs> it's a long story. What's your Twitter handle, it, Nathan? Uh, it might be Nathan Loves Tree. <laughs> Only because it wouldn't let me put the S in. It's like too many characters. So. Anyway, you need some tree hugger kids. I know. I'm just telling you. That if you're interested, then... Yeah, we'll put a link in the 
yeah. the post. Or you, because they they sponsored beer camp. I know. Yeah. So you can also just email me. You can email trip at homebrewedchristianity dot com, and then I'll just connect you with Eric. That's another way of doing it. Um, or you can tweet me. And I'll make sure you connect with him on Twitter because he, he, I tried to talk him into using Twitter for the book, but he's a Catholic social ethicist, <laughs> and they're they succeed by being in the 16th century. They, that's how they evolved. are. All of his tweets in Latin? Uh, no. <laughs> so um, yeah, so this was uh, his um, inspiring, uh, luring talk on behalf of the Catholic tradition to us at beer camp, uh, and it, it was a bunch of fun. I love Eric. Really appreciated him being there. And if you if you if you aren't a regular podcast listener to some of the other podcasts that are there, he's been on a bunch of other podcasts. So if you go check out our friends at Christian Humanist Podcast, Pat Theological, um, Newsworthy with Norsworthy, Brew Theology, Brew Theology, um, Culture Cast, Culture Cast, like all the other podcasts are there. We're also recording episodes with our guests and stuff. Um, and and there's a really cool crossover episode. Uh, between Newsworthy and Norsworthy and uh, Christian Humanist and Crackers and Grape Juice that Eric was in on. Mm-hmm. Um, you should listen to that because you know, they're kind of like, you know, I'm witnessing to all of them. I'm trying to show them that progressive Christianity is still thoroughly Christian and not that backwards. They, they just, you know, they're just way too smitten they, with, with probably Hauerwas. Huh. Alistair McIntyre, people like that, which they, which are which is an okay thing to be. So they they like snuck off into my office and recorded this episode, uh, which which was recorded during beer camp. But um, it was not, it was not a sanctioned beer camp. Event. No, no. But you know, it's all it, if that's the first time they start to rebel, um, then maybe next time they can rebel from participating in communities that uh, make creedal commitments necessary for <laughs> inclusion. But. Um, all right, that was my last sarcastic comment in there. And, and he's Eric, about to mock me on this. Yeah, and, and he also has a like a, a blog on the, the Humber page. Oh yeah, right? the Catholic Corner. Catholic Corner. You Those should go check funny. it out. And in, oh, I totally forgot about this. He just finished uh, the three discussion videos for people using the book. So if you're if you have the book, want to get the book, um, then uh, I have three videos you can use for discussion groups that are great. Um, like. Uh, he was like, "Oh, what something I could do to help people, in, you know, use the book or whatever." And he made these videos, and and he said that if you your church group uses them or discussion group or whatever, uses the videos or the book, and then um, he, you know, he could talk you into using the book by joining digitally to your class for some Q and A. At the end of it, he'd do that too. So um, check out the book, and you you could even have your the your whole discussion group go like. Why are all the cool process comments inserted into your book and the voice of random characters sound just like Trip and cooler than what you said? You could ask him that. Uh, <laughs> you ask him about Vishnu, too. Oh, yeah. Since Vishnu gave a pretty good review. I know. Like, So if you go on the back of the book and like Jay Baker is like, I, I have something nice to say. Doug Tuk, who's in charge of like Catholic youth ministries and stuff like that. But Vishnu, rarely, I think this might be the first uh, Fortress book that Vishnu has endorsed. endorsed yeah. Yeah. Vishnu said, I couldn't put it down, and I have four hands. <laughs> Pick up this book. <laughs> and so, like, you got to trust Vishnu about these things. Yeah, you, you know, that's a reliable source there. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, yeah, well, this is, this is, this, this is, I forgot to mention that we're, it's for Theology Beer yeah, Camp. Yeah, go to Theology so. Beer Camp right now. Dot com. Right now. It's the cheapest day to get on. Hit pause. It's not going to go anywhere. Go yeah. Theology Beer Because Theology Beer Camp. With Peter Rollins and me and Nathan, we're going to be going uh, to Oklahoma on the 18th and 19th of August. Nope. We're nope. going to Denver on the 18th and 19th. <laughs> See, I was testing. It's I was testing. Test. It's just a test. The website's correct. The 18th and 19th, we're going to be in Denver. And our friends at Brew Theology are putting together uh, a legendary event. I got a text message today describing our lunch on day two. I know. I'm really excited. And I went on Yelp and read the reviews of of our food truck taco provider and they're pretty epic like i got hungry it's not carb day for trip and i wanted tacos <laughs> uh, but every day's carb day at beer camp <laughs> <laughs> that should be our tagline yeah um yeah uh, you want to guess how much weight i gained during beer camp uh no i actually didn't gain that much because uh <laughs> i think i weighed myself very dehydrated at the end mm. and then, so i just then waited a week yeah yeah but, well, you know. you know, 
Went in beer camp. <sighs> yeah. Not so much that I couldn't wear my new clothes at the end of beer camp. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, anyway. And we'll be in Oklahoma City on the 25th and 26th. Correct. Amundo. Um, and somewhere in between those dates, we're going to see the the, the uh, eclipse. The the total solar eclipse. The total solar eclipse. Do you know how? You're very excited. I'm about very this. excited about this. I I've I'm already planning how Pete's we're gonna. Pete's gonna Pete's gonna see it, and he's gonna have a, a spiritual experience. I might be so spiritual, he agrees more with C.S. Lewis when he does a C.S. Lewis event in Ireland. <laughs> um, no comment. Look. I, I'm trying to decide if I can just dedicate a whole session during beer camp. Like, we're going to argue. We're going to pick topics, and we're going to basically try to persuade the audience who is there to start thinking we're cooler than the other one because we, since we're friends, we can argue with each other rather intensely. And then um, hopefully in that, then people start thinking back and forth, and you ask real cool questions, and like the discussion time gets crazy. And then you're like, clearly the only way we can synthesize this is group singing. And, uh, and, and I'm personally working on getting – Talking Pete into participating in karaoke. He's told me that I have, price tag's pretty high. Yeah, I have to pay him a thousand dollars a song, and and I'm like, I've never heard you sing. So the more people come to beer camp, the more likely <laughs> we can get him to sing. <laughs> and and uh, but I'm thinking of like a duet that if I did talk him into singing it. So if you have suggestions on duets, tweet then, then let us trip know. and Pete hashtag theology beer camp. Yeah, hashtag duet. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm pretty open to what it could be. Like, um, you know, what's the, uh, uh, what's the, the Tom Petty duet? The, um, uh, Stevie Nicks and Tom Petty? I don't know. Oh, jeez. And I heard it the other day. I was like, Pete and I should do that. <laughs> obviously, obviously I would, I would be Stevie Nicks because I got, I got a falsetto that can go there. Yeah. And he can be Tom Petty because, Tom Petty just has to be cool while he sings. He doesn't have to do hit notes or anything. Yeah. And I thought instead of like combined, you guys are like an Irish tenor because mm. you're the, you're the tenor part, and I can do the dancing. There you go. I'll dance. That, there it is. Or or a whole new world from Aladdin. <laughs> I think that could that would really work. I think so. Like uh, um, a whole new. Don't you dare close your eyes. Yeah. A new fantastic point of view. Like in. In, that would really be a crescendo one of the nights during beer camp. So you should go to theologybeercamp.com, buy tickets so that that can happen. I know. Uh, I mean, personally, like, 90s rock music tends to be my jam when it comes to karaoke. I I actually found out that Denver Group has a, um, a, uh, a, a karaoke grand marshal. I think that's what he wanted his name to be. Or, so, yeah, yeah, I saw Grandmaster like of Karaoke yeah. or, or something like that. And I thought, that is what I'm talking about. Because <laughs> like, when a location isn't like, oh, we're going to we're gonna get everything ready, we're going to have awesome karaoke and junk, but they're like, no, no, no. We have someone who so owns karaoke that this is like the Grandmaster of Karaoke. That's and, what I'm talking about. And he has been known to rock early 90s rap music, which... Whoa. That's that is just hard to do. Yeah, because like it's. I think that rap is the hardest at karaoke. It might just be uh, for me. Yeah, because like I always thought I could rap. <laughs> I, I have some videos of me doing um, DC talk rap songs in middle school at youth events, Ooh, and when well, I look at them, those. when I look at them, I say to myself, I was not nearly as good as in reality <laughs> as I was in my head. Uh, so. <laughs> But you know who is really good in reality? Eric Hall. That's right. And so is God. That's why he wrote a book <laughs> about everything he needed to know about the Almighty. And, and and yes, yes, I'm pretty sure that subtitle's there just to give me a hard time because I'm against using the word Almighty to God. And I, and I am just because I'm a biblical Christian. But he's a Catholic Christian, so <laughs> I love you too, Eric. Here you go. So trip kind of ruined my introduction. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyways. Let's just let's just see what happens, okay? So hi. I'm Eric, and I need to say something just a little bit disturbing to you. I'm gonna whisper it at first to see if you can hear it, easing you into the cacophonic news to come. Catholic. Did you hear that? Really not sure I want to say it again. Said I'm Catholic. 
I know I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just apologize for that up front. You see, I'm here because my bishop sent me to convert you. And he promised me that I'd receive an extra piece of Christ's body for each infidel that I brought to Catholic Jesus. I can't get any extra blood, though, unless I begin either an inquisition or a crusade. Both of which I'm hardly working on and maybe can submit to your observations next time around. Is it too soon after 9-11 for that one? Absolutely no joking aside. I'm one of those former evangelical types who, for the sweet Lord's sake, became Catholic. I know, I know. You've likely got a ton of rightful assumptions that this type of uh, conversion has become some sort of a thing. And it has. I mean, Relevant Magazine recently did a piece on it called Cool Catholics. And obviously they're including converts like me based on my Under Armour trucker hat and my chucks. But these are people who tend to find themselves Catholic in the style of Pope Francis, which I can definitively say is the daddy of cool. So to ease you into the information I've just sprung on you, the first activity I want to engage in with you should be kind of fun. I want to take a vote. I'll present you with, say, five sorts of reasons evangelicals become Catholic, and you vote on the one that you think is the most important reason. Of course, this is not working right now, so you may not be able to vote. Hmm, it says, the connection is not working. How about we just do this? We can take an audible vote. Here's my first reason that uh, we become Catholic. We heard on eagle's wings one too many times and obviously needed to get away from the song. I think that's not a bad reason. We really like fetishizing the role of men in the church and are likely uncomfortable in our own sexual skin. Ooh. That's rough. We wanted to move from a position of unthinking theology to unthinking theology that smelled more like frankincense. (laughs) We needed more statues cluttering up the house and yard full time, not only at Christmas for Pete's sake. Or, and I like this one, we wanted a faith in which we could gamble and drink. So in each of these, I could likely find a grain of truth. You all obviously have the drinking part down. I could tell by last night, but I don't see anyone shooting dice like we encourage our youth to do in the basement. I'm also not a huge fan of praise music, but that's less because I'm Catholic and more because I grew up playing jazz and liking Paul Simon. Moreover, I've actually never fetishized the role of male leadership in the church. I'd support female priests, but I say so without any hope that Catholic life becomes any less clerically manipulated, to be totally honest. I was Episcopalian for a while, and despite my own wonderful female rector, I found clericalism and its power issues to be just as rampant there as anywhere else. I just think that men and women alike should likely have the privilege of seeking power. But mostly, this is supposed to be a joke with the slide here, I needed a way to authenticate my St. Francis bird feeder in my garden. Now, in this brief talk, I want to give you the real reasons I ended up becoming Catholic. I promise I'm not trying to convert you like I said I was at the beginning. I'm really not. Uh, But I am trying to bring you into a position of what I think is intellectual honesty with yourselves. In whatever tradition you may find yourselves. And although my blog on HBC, uh, Homebrewed Christianity, is called Catholic Corner, which claims to bear witness to liberal Protestants through thought, thought, word, and mead, I'm kind of just screwing with you, and I'm trying to provoke you into buying my book. So that's kind of the truth. (laughs) All that said, my reasons for becoming Catholic strangely have to do with our contemporary misuse, abuse, and ignorance of tradition, which I hope you'll allow me to expound on a little bit, because I'm hoping you'll learn to as awkwardly embrace your tradition, whatever it is, as I've tried to embrace my super awkward Catholic convert genuflecting, and find freedom precisely in that. So, what is tradition? Tradition can be kind of a tough concept, right? Let's be honest, it just seems so traditional. 
But it can only, it's only tough because we tend to ignore it on an average everyday basis, at least at an explicit level of thought, uh, in the U.S. Ironically, I think the U.S. is a place that Allah the Enlightenment has made a tradition out of ignoring and rejecting tradition. But tradition surrounds us. It defines us, informs us. Tradition is all around us. It may even be us. So what is it? Well, I'd hope it's not merely the expectation that upon marriage, here comes the bride will be played at the ceremony. Or celebrate good times will be played at the reception, which I think will definitively be replaced by uptown funk by the time I'm 50. Yet these choices are manifestations of tradition. I'd also hope that tradition isn't merely found in the capacity to recognize a bad handshake, although I think a bad handshake is bad because we recognize it through tradition and a learned tradition of good handshakes. It's a tradition to give a handshake. It's not just normal. Positively speaking, though, tradition is a set of assumptions, understandings, cares, and expectations Expectations that inform the way that we live and act ourselves out in the world. And I'm just going to define these really quickly and not get too bogged down in them. By assumptions, I mean those ideas that we have which undergird us without us even knowing it. And we all have those. Understandings are the manifestations of our assumptions. Insights that come about because of the lenses we have on and retain through our assumptions. Cares are those understandings that we buy into, wholeheartedly identifying ourselves with. And expectations are those possibilities we see in the world because of our assumptions, understandings, and beliefs. Let's take a couple of examples. One negative and the other positive to show you how these things play themselves out in and through tradition. If you grow up under Jim Crow, there's a good chance you're going to develop and unconsciously embrace a certain racial paradigm. White folks are worth more than black folks, right? Well, no, not right, but that is the paradigm you grow up under. Honestly, it may not take Jim Crow to produce this mindset, which we continue to see in some subtler ways and sometimes not so subtle ways today. Either way, you wouldn't be able to help it, especially under Jim Crow. The very space in which you grow up fosters such thought and socialization. Two drinking fountains, separated as the servant quarters are separated from the household and definitively different in quality. You ask your parents why the man with the darker skin has to drink over there and without necessarily having conscious malice, your parents answer uh, to use likely the kinder parlance of the time, well, because he's colored. This is a world that you've been inculcated into. In other words, you've been thrown into a world where your assumptions have been totally and completely formed by segregation. These assumptions have manifested themselves in the understanding that some items are for me and some for others. And the fact of segregation unfolds itself into the possibility of becoming a care, namely a belief that you fight for or hopefully in this case against. But more than anything, the fact of segregation unfolds for both the white and the black participants. Certain expectations, such as which drinking fountain is for whom, and whether you're allowed to go to college or not. I bring up Jim Crow South because it's an easy example through which to see negative example of tradition, right? I'm not so sure things are terribly different culturally than they used to be given the incarceration of young black men in the country today, but I honestly don't think it's my place to speak on this issue. Listen to some of the good folks in BLM instead. Either way, Jim Crow's a doozy, and it ought at least to have you asking yourself, so why in the world would I be interested in embracing tradition when it leads to lack of justice, social or otherwise? In response, about this next example. As with uh, examples of uh, anything in the 20th century done <laughs> ethically well, I have to, of course, go back to World War II and bring up the Nazis, despite my trying to think of almost anything else that we don't have to talk about that more. But in this case, I have to bring up these pastors whom I greatly, greatly admire. And to my credit, they at least stood up against the Vichy government, which was, of 
course, the French puppet government to the Nazis. So at least there's a little distance there. André Trocmé was a pastor in a small French village bordering Switzerland called Les Chambon. During World War II, Trocmé uttered utterly dedicated himself, his congregation, and his village to hiding Jews, especially Jewish children, from the Vichy government, helping them to find safe passage through old Huguenot trails to Switzerland from when they themselves had to escape the long reach of Catholic dragoons who wanted to stamp out Protestantism in France. Another good check for my tradition. As the ethicist Philip Halley writes about Trocmé, The center of his thought was the belief that God showed how important man was by becoming a human being, and by becoming a particular sort of human being who is the embodiment of sacrificially generous love. For Trocme, every human being was like Jesus, had God in him or her, and was just as precious as God himself. And when Trocme, with the help of the Quakers and others, organized his village into the most efficient rescue machine in Europe, he did so not only to save the Jews, but also to save the Nazis and their collaborators. He wanted to keep them from blackening their souls with more evil. He wanted to save them, the victimizers, from themselves. Unquote. What I believe is especially noteworthy of Trocme and the people of Les Chambon is that the persons they saved expressed not just gratitude for their lives, there were other people doing that as well, but gratitude that someone was willing to offer them dignity back. You see, they didn't just save people, they reinvested their humanity in them. They left them flowers when they would come. So they put the entire village in danger, right? Because they're hiding these Jewish children. And the villagers would go out of their way to leave flowers for those children just to invest them once more with a sense of human dignity. And the persons who were saved remembered. The utter mercy and Christ-centeredness of Trochme has never escaped me after I first read about him in an essay I just quoted called From Cruelty to Goodness. Of the many persons saved by Trochme's hand, one commented that the Holocaust was storm, lightning, thunder, wind, rain, yes. And Le Chambon was the rainbow. And Trochme does not extend his divine hand to persons despite tradition, and this is the point I'm getting at here. He does it precisely through and because of tradition, namely the Christian tradition, one that specifically remains ever focused on the beauty and mercy of the incarnation. You see, tradition in itself can be either good or bad, and it can manifest itself in either unacceptable injustice or supreme mercy, heinous hatred or the beauty of hospitality and love. We all too often, in fact, can contrapose tradition with progress, which is a great mistake, I think. Why? Because such a view tends to think of tradition solely as a set of biases, which I'm going to address more in a little bit. But tradition is lifeblood. And it's for these very reasons that we have to take up on and manifest the best of our traditions with the gusto of a teen who has just discovered Miller Light with voracious ambition and unquenchable thirst. Maybe I should be talking about you after the beers last night. For true progress is, progress is never a movement away from tradition, but a positive movement within tradition, so I'd argue. But we have to take up tradition properly, and here's my reasoning on how to do so. First, We have to acknowledge that, like it or not, we cannot get away from tradition. By that, I simply mean we can't get away from the fact that we've been cognitively and socially influenced by others who are different from ourselves. I know that this has become an antithetical statement to one of our highest ethical ideals today, namely, to be socially and cognitively individualized. We complain constantly about socialization, and we tell people, for instance, all the time that they have to really know who they are before, for instance, they enter into marriage. Heck, Whitney Houston even sang a song in the 90s about how self-love is the greatest of all. Fine with both of those. There's some truth in these above sentiments, but they also certainly fail to recognize that we can only know who we are most fully in relationship. And one of the most important relationships we might foster is, frankly, with dead people. 
and knowing where we come from. We got to get to know our tradition. So we should acknowledge tradition. But this leaves the question begged as to why we should ever embrace tradition, does it not? And I think my beginning answer just started to come forward. To know yourself and where you came from. That any self-knowledge depends on a knowledge of who you are in a tradition. But I think a fuller answer can be developed in a twofold manner. The first of which I'll express to you through a gentleman who was at one time a reporter for NPR and fired in 2010. I'll read the quick story from the NPR site. NPR News has terminated the contract of longtime news analyst Juan Williams after a mark he made on the Fox News channel about Muslims. Williams appeared on Monday on the O'Reilly Factor, and the host Bill O'Reilly asked him to comment on the idea that the U.S. is facing a dilemma with Muslims. O'Reilly has been looking for support for his own remarks on a recent episode of ABC's The View, in which he directly blamed Muslims for September 11, 2001 attacks. Co-hosts uh, Joy Bayer and Whoopi Goldberg walked off the set in the middle of the appearance. Williams reported, look, Bill, I'm not a bigot. You know the kind of books I've written about civil rights movement in this country, but when I get on a plane, i got to tell you, if I see people who are Muslim in Muslim garb, and I think, you know, they're identifying themselves first and foremost as Muslims, I get worried. I get nervous, he says. Williams also warned O'Reilly against blaming all Muslims, Muslims for extremists, saying Christians shouldn't be blamed for Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh. But strong uh, criticism followed Williams' comments. Late Wednesday night, NPR issued a statement praising Williams as a valuable contributor, but saying it had given him notice that it's severing his contract. Quote, his remarks on the O'Reilly factor this past Monday were inconsistent with our editorial standards and practices and undermined his credibility as a news analyst with NPR, the statement read. Now, I love the soft and sultry voices of NPR and the ways that all the newscasters can shift from plain West Coast English to the perfect ethnic pronunciation of any word. (laughs) But they screwed up, I think, big time on this one, and you got to let me explain why I think that's the case. Out of a fear for who they themselves might actually be, NPR producers hid their collective heads really in their asses, and fired Williams for, one, his utter honesty about who he'd become, and two, his utter disregard for what he'd become as well. That's a twofold process there. They took away one of the primary tools we have for ethical change. We want to go back to Adam's talk, recognizing how our desires need to be shifted. The power of self-acknowledgement and what I would call benign self-alienation in recognizing the wrongness, perhaps, of the tradition one's been inculcated into. Williams had obviously been affected by tradition. Whether we call it a post-9-11 tradition or a tradition that's manifested itself in parts of the West on a number of occasions, he felt uncomfortable getting on a plane with self-identifying Muslims after the 9-11 attacks. Upon hearing this, of course, we're liable to tweet any number of unseemly things against Williams. But I think the truth is he tapped into a zeitgeist that many of the rest of us didn't have the courage to talk about and face. And then he rightly said he didn't want it, which NPR never seemed to really acknowledge. But that's the fundamental ethical move he made with regard to a negative tradition handed down to him. Look at it this way. Williams saw his tradition and he saw himself in light of the tradition and said, no, thank you. He saw the way in which he could have been formed by fear and he saw what it could lead him to do and act in discriminatory ways against Muslims and he rejected himself, who he'd become, casting himself into a state of benign self-alienation, openly acknowledging that he did not like what he wanted become. Self-alienation is an important tool. We don't like to talk about that, right? We have these first-order desires that define who we are, but then we begin to look at those first-order desires at a second-order level and say, is that really who I want to be? And if we say no, we cast ourselves into the state of self-alienation, which I would say is better than being in a state of wholeheartedness where we affirm our first-order desires if those first-order desires suck. 
That's, strangely, the first reason to embrace tradition. Sometimes we need to take a long look at who we've unconsciously become and say to ourselves, yep, I'm now an asshole and I need to change. And because you're indistinct from the tradition in which you've produced your change, if you can effectively will it, affects a change in the tradition as well, often for the better. Hopefully. Sometimes not, unfortunately. That's why I say above that any true progress isn't a rejection of tradition, but a reshaping of it. It's progress within tradition. The second reason to embrace tradition, however, is fundamentally different. We've just talked about the way tradition develops what we generally call biases, right? However, we fall into untruth when we think that's all tradition creates, which is where we tend to stand with tradition today. In a better sense, we can say that tradition is a set of bifocals. If built well, these bifocals take one's mired vision and fixes it by projecting it into the world in a proper manner. Tradition can act in this way, too, when we allow it to do so. Andre Trokme, I believe, presents an example of this above when he risks his life for Jewish children. But we can also point to the good Pope Francis. Far from being an iconoclast and an anti-traditionalist, which is how he is oftentimes presented, I think Francis takes the best of what the Catholic tradition is and represents. A tradition that offers preferential treatment to the poor that uh, washes the feet of young, jailed Muslim women, and that attempts to incarnately live through the Eucharistic feast, the truth and mercy of Christ in all things. In fact, I think there's a hilarious appropriation of Francis from both the right and the left. All of them think he's liberal. I get tired of this conversation. I do. I mean, in some ways he is, I suppose. But listen to him, and you'll see that he really and truly adheres to the doctrines of the Catholic Church, frankly, sometimes uncomfortably so. He's quite conservative, you would say, in this way. However, he never sees people as serving the doctrines and the rules, and this is where he's beautiful. He never uses them as a bludgeon to ensure orthodoxy and adherence to the Church. Rather, he sees the canonic God who came to us in mercy, and submits pastorally to people in their real needs in mercy as well, even if it sometimes reinterprets the rules. I teach a lot of Confucius. He's a Catholic of the East, or perhaps we're the Confucians of the West. Both place a heavy and insightful emphasis on tradition in such a way that they're mutually complementary to one another, both theologically and philosophically. The point is that Confucius believes that the only way to become fully human is to so totally and thoroughly embrace tradition, which defines us, that we learn to affirm the best of the tradition in ourselves and live it out in a spontaneous and, if you will, unmediated way. Um, I think the best paper I've actually ever read on this and this is a paper for me as I grow up playing jazz that I, that I really can affirm, expresses this within a Confucian philosophy in terms of a jazz quartet. In a quartet, there's a lived tradition emerging. As each instrumentalist grounds him or herself in the greats, Davis, Coltrane, Monk, without reducing him or herself to these greats. The members of the quartet become lived and spontaneous expressions of the past, projecting the best of that history and its beauty on into the future. How else might we describe a solo but in this way? An individual expression of the courting and melody at hand, the tradition from within which the members of the quartet is playing. No longer captured by tradition in a merely imprisoned manner, you could say. These musicians become freed from traditionalism to become that tradition. They're freed for tradition. And that's what I see Pope Francis doing with the Catholic tradition as well. So, let me reiterate this point, then we'll move on. We usually see Tradition is a set of biases, but I think tradition actually orients us to the truth first and becomes biased second, just as the spots and smudges on a set of glasses blur what we should have been seeing all along. 
And I think this point is especially important. Tradition can become heinously biased when we attempt to ignore it. I think that's the most dangerous thing. If we ignore it and we don't take care of it, that's when those smudges emerge on those glasses most uh, grotesquely, you could say. When we pretend like it's not there, just as the cancer grows stronger and stronger in our ignorance of it. I believe our friend Jason can speak to this experience better than I can. So there's a reason I called this the Homebrewed Christianity Guide to Bourbon. This particular talk, here it is. In my book, The Homebrewed Christianity Guide to God, I deal with all this at the level of our talk of God in chapter 5, which is titled, uh, God is spiritual, is God spiritual but not religious? In it, I ask whether it's helpful to claim that we're spiritual but not religious, the latter of which always presents language of God through tradition. I don't think it is actually that helpful of a language, even if I greatly understand the sentiment. I actually wrote that chapter as a self-critique. I rather think that we should learn to embrace tradition and embrace it well. And to this end, I suggest the following image for understanding tradition and developing a good relationship to it. Bourbon. Indeed, if Arians would have talked about bourbon the way that they talked about Jesus, they would have been correct. The firstborn of creation. Amen, right? But... To, of course, bring them back into good Trinitarian orthodoxy, I want to say it's obviously generated by the Father, made through the Son, and distilled to perfection by the Spirit. (laughs) Yeah, you can give me a boo, too. That's fine. That's a totally corny theology joke there. At any rate, here's what I say. We persons, our families and our communities, are bourbon. Tradition is the cask in which the bourbon is aged, And we need to ensure that we're aged in the barrel of tradition just the right amount of time to prevent ourselves from becoming too astringent by being aged too long or too shallow by being aged too little. If we age too long, we become the traditionalist who makes the person serve the tradition. Perhaps you've met this person. She's the one who seems to be hell-bent on enforcing rules and regulations down to the detail of how many times the garland needs to wrap around the damned Christmas tree. We call those liturgists in the Catholic world. If we're aged in the bourbon barrel of tradition too little, we become, well, shallowed, dishonest with ourselves, without self-knowledge. We know this person, too. It might be us. It has certainly been me. I know I fall closer to this side. Again, in the Catholic world, though, uh, we've strangely come to call these folks (laughs) Jesuits. (laughs) That's a good Catholic joke, by the way. Uh, I just want you to know that. And I was supposed to have a friend here who was training up at LMU to become Jesuit, so I wrote that specifically for him. Both sides can, need, and should be deepened, which is likely the best reason I can... I can give you that I became Catholic. It's not for the statues or because I want frankincense-smelling theology that I rejoined the ancient Catholic Church. I'm really not even that good at any Catholic crap yet. If I'm honest, then I still get weirded out by things like confession after a lifetime of just saying, hey, sorry, Big J. But for one, I had been intellectually Catholic for a very long time, having been trained by many Catholic philosophers and theologians along my educational path. And I've long found myself thinking like many of the Catholic greats about God and who Christ is, even in my difference from them. Second, much of my extended family is Catholic, my mother and her siblings understandably breaking away from the Catholic Church because of the severe treatment they frankly received prior to Vatican II in their education. I get it. My mom was actually scandalized by by my coming Catholic. It was tough for her, and I was very sympathetic to her. I don't blame them in the least, but a return to Catholicism was a return also to my family's traditional faith in many ways, and that meant something to me. Third, my wife and I found the Catholic community in Helena quite vibrant, and both of us, more than anything else, decided we wanted to raise our children around such people. Of course, you have to make it to Mass a little more than I do to do that, but which we're still working on. But it was a very important point in theory. 
Fourth, I realized I was also so defined by the Catholic tradition that I needed to take the plunge and become a part of it, giving myself over to what I had already been for quite some time. Despite the cognitive dissonance, the discomfort of having to say, I used to be evangelical and I'm one of those dudes who became Catholic now. Right? I I don't like that. That becomes just sort of a cliche. That's uncomfortable, but that's what I am. That said, there's a bit more. At the level of care and belief, there's an important and conscientious idea that I think the Catholic Church arguably protects more than anything else. That is, I believe the incarnation to be the most important Christian doctrine, and the Catholic Church, even in its folly, adheres most closely to this divine dogma. And that the Catholic Church at its best, and when it dedicates itself to the incarnation, looks an awful lot like our current Pope Francis, who is the lived embodiment of Catholicism in its best form. And he, frankly, looks an awful lot like Jesus to me. And my point in this talk is to get you to take tradition seriously. And to appropriate it in a healthy way, rather than the somewhat schizophrenic way we usually think of tradition today. I'll add that that's exactly what I've tried to help you do in my book, The Homebrewed Christianity Guide to to God, uh, preposterously subtitled, Everything You Ever Needed to Know About the Almighty. And after after listening to Adam's talk, I just want to say it sounds like there is a very, very constructive use of, of tradition in both senses of which I'm talking about and how he's talking about salvation. I've not ignored tradition in this book. Rather, I've engaged tradition as fully as possible, sifting through the Western Christian tradition and especially to distill out what it means to think about God and to think about God well. I'm trying to wipe the smudges of bias and get on the right bifocals. I'm most critical in this book of what I'd call the Jersey Shore God, who is likely the God we're most unconsciously familiar with uh, de facto today. It's the one who we tend to buy into, or the one we find uh, we want to reject, because it's the only one that we've come to know. This God's generally angry, showing a sort of pseudo-love to us by killing his son instead of us, and most certainly temperamental about whose goats you should be sacrificing where. That is, many buy into the Jersey Shore God, with the, ex- with the exception, perhaps, of this crowd, which, uh, by way of trip, knows at least a little something about, say, process thought. That point aside, in my book, I try to bring you through five historical concepts of God. Mr. Miyagi stands for classical theism, Jersey Shore for voluntarism, retired Oprah for deism, your hippie aunt for process thought, which is one of my favorites, and Joan of Arc for a little-known concept called the hermeneutic God. Grounding myself in what I think is the truth of Miyagi, I try to argue also for important conceptual incorporations of your hippie aunt and Joan of Arc. Knowing that most traditions, even when I disagree with them, yield important kernels of truth. When you get uh, what you get by chapter four, which is called Sifting the Beer from the Suds, is a Japanese karate master with a teenage face of Joan of Arc, who's obviously leading a cosmic drum circle, as is your hippie aunt. My hope is that whatever you believe now, you'll be confronted in this book with a deeper sense of the Western tradition than you currently know. That even if the substance of your thought and faith don't change, the way in which you, uh, the way in which you believe comes to be such that you think and believe from the standpoint of embraced and known tradition, rather than the usual ignorance that binds us, and perhaps dangerously binds us. And I also try to do something similar with what I would call the Norwegian hippie Jesus. The Eurocentrized notion of Jesus, what he means, and how he functions in this world. And I actually buy into one of the models, at least partially, that Adam was talking about earlier, called the Christus Victor model, which is a beginning point and maybe doesn't go far enough. Many of you will disagree with my conclusions. You will. No worries on this end. That's often a sign of thoughtfulness and embrace, so long as you don't merely lash out as commentators on my blog sometimes do with, that's a straw man. (laughs) Now, I don't ask you to agree, but I do ask you to delve into the depths of tradition to see what pearls and perils lay hidden within it, and to come out on the other end sometimes more confused, 
sometimes more certain, but ever more steadfast in an embrace of the world from whence we've all come for all its goods and ills. Thank you.